A good place to start our study of Hebrew poetry is with the ideas of Robert Loth, the 18th century Anglican bishop. And Loth, as we'll see, came up with three types of what he called Hebrew parallelism. But before we get there, I just want to ask a very broad question to get us started. And that's the question, what is poetry in the Bible? So what is poetry? And by that I mean, what are some of the basic features of it? What should we focus on when we zoom into a particular passage? Now, the first thing to note is that when you open almost any modern Bible, you're going to see that some passages are clearly set apart as poetry and some are set apart as prose. So prose is regular text, okay, and you can see that here, whereas poetry, all right, poetry clearly has lines indented, the lines don't go all the way to the right side. It's very uh, very obvious that these are different types of text, right? Prose and poetry. And the example I've picked here is from the book of Job. So as you start chapter 3, you see that it suddenly turns to poetry. And in fact, if we look at the entire book of Job, okay, the entire book, the first two chapters, 1 and 2, are prose, and then the rest of the book is entirely poetry, except for the last chapter, 42, which returns us again to prose. If that's the case, if so much of that book is poetry, well, then it's probably important to figure out what makes it poetic. And it's interesting how often we simply ignore that question. So what makes it poetic? What have scholars looked at over the centuries? Uh, well, the first thing that they, or one of the things they often look at is whether it rhymes. That's a natural thing to uh, to examine. As it turns out, in the original Hebrew, there is little rhyme. Okay, so there's occasional rhyme, but it's not a major feature. Um, well, what about meter? So by meter, we mean the rhythm of the line. If you think, for instance, of a Shakespeare sonnet, it has a particular rhythm, right? Pa-pom, pa-pom, pa-pom. That, that's what we call iambic pentameter, for example. This is one of the, the most contested parts of Hebrew poetry. Is there actually meter? Some scholars say yes, and some scholars say absolutely not. So it's not a, a question that we're going to get into, because you really have to be able to read the original Hebrew. Uh, but a lot of scholars feel that meter is not a significant feature, and that in any case it's very difficult to determine what often the meter might be. Another thing that we can note, and this is quite important, um, most of the poems in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, have very short lines. Okay, so short lines. And that, I think, is significant. It gives the lines quite a quick pace, so nothing is drawn out, it's very quick. Uh, but at the same time, the, the lines are often a bit like proverbs. They make you think, right? There's a lot of wisdom in them. And that forces you to slow down, on the other hand. It forces you to meditate on what the lines actually mean. So there's this wonderful kind of combination of quickness and slowing down and meditating. And the two definitely go hand in hand. Now, as you can see, uh, there is some debate then about some of these things. How much rhyme is there? How much meter is there? What's the significance of these short lines? And what is intentional or not? Uh, and that that kind of confusion has been there for a long time, although we know much more now than we did in the past. If you go all the way back, for instance, to the 1580s, and you look at the work of the Protestant writer Sir Philip Sidney, he makes an interesting observation about uh, biblical poetry. He says, the Holy David Psalms are a divine poem, right? So he recognizes clearly that this is a poem. And then he adds that he believed that, uh, quote, it is fully written in meter, as all learned Hebritians agree, although the rules be not yet fully found, which is somewhat humorous, isn't it? It's kind of saying, well, there's probably meter, but nobody can agree on the lines. Let's hope in the future this becomes more cl uh, clear. So that's an interesting moment because it really suggests that when Sidney was writing, nothing was absolutely clear, and for centuries people had really wondered about this. That's the point when we turn to Robert Loth. Okay, so what Loth teaches us in the 18th century is that there's 
there, there's one main feature of Hebrew poetry that really stands out, and that's what he refers to as parallelism. Okay, so parallelism. There we go, Hebrew parallelism. The idea that lines run parallel to each other and have a lot in common with each other, although sometimes there's a contrast, uh, but each set of lines has a relationship to each other. It's not so much about rhyme, it's about the way the lines relate to one another. Okay, so it might be nice then, before we really dig into uh, some specific examples, to know a bit more about who Robert Loth actually was. Here's a, a quick bio of Robert Loth. He lived from 1710 to 1787. He was an Anglican clergyman, as, as I mentioned, uh, and in this sense he followed in the footsteps of his father. From 1741 on, he was also professor of poetry at Oxford, and he very often lectured on Hebrew poetry. In 1753, he took many of these lectures and he published them. Uh, he published 34 lectures in a Latin treatise, and the name of the treatise, I'll just give you the English version here, is On the Sacred Poetry of the Hebrews. Now, that particular volume became more popular after it was translated into English, and that happened in 1787 uh, by a fellow named George Gregory, uh, and you can find this fairly easily online, actually. So if you want to read the original, uh, that would be the place to look. A little bit more about his personal life might be of interest. So in 1752, he got married to Mary Jackson, ended up having seven kids, but somewhat of a tragic life because five of them died uh, quite young. Towards the end of his life, he was asked to be Archbishop of Canterbury, quite an honor, but he declined, uh, possibly due to ill health. And then finally, he's, uh, Robert Loth is also quite well known for his work on English grammar and for a translation of the book of Isaiah. So that gives you just a quick overview of who Robert Loth was, and next we'll talk about his three types of parallelism. Robert Loth talks about parallelism in the 19th chapter of his book, which is significant because parallelism is not his main focus. Uh, one of the things he really wants to show is that the prophetic books in the Old Testament are just as poetic as, let's say, the book of Psalms or Job. Uh, another thing he's interested in is pointing out that um, Old Testament poetry is sublime, just as sublime and awe-inspiring as, let's say, classical literature, even though it's written in a rather plain style. So those are his main aims, but he does give us some really interesting insights into parallelism as well. And a good example of parallelism is Psalm 122, verse 7. So Psalm 122, verse 7. As you read these lines, you can hear how they echo each other. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. So peace and security echo each other, and your walls and your citadels are kind of the same thing as well, right? A citadel is a type of fortress. So these lines then run parallel to each other. Think of them as somewhat like railway tracks, uh, and they, they simply go on together as a, si a single unit. So that is parallel structure, and Loth argued that you can find it throughout Hebrew poetry, uh, and it really comes in three types, according to Loth. So the first type is what he called synonymous, which is exactly what we just saw, synonymous. That's where the lines are equal to each other, right? They echo each other. A perfect example is Psalm 114. The entire psalm consists of synonymous parallelism. And you can pause the video and read the psalm carefully, and you'll hear this. It's a, it's a very unique effect, all of this repetition. So verse 3 is a good example. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back. Right? The lines are synonymous to each other. Uh, I should say this is quite rare for an entire psalm to be like this, which makes it stand out all the more. Our next example, and this is still synonymous parallelism, uh, comes from Isaiah 54 verse 5. This is a slight variation that we call interlinear, interlinear parallelism. So interlinear 
Okay, and as I mentioned, it's a form of synonymous parallelism. So in this case, uh, we read, for your maker is your husband, and that line doesn't get repeated until the third line. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. So husband and Redeemer are seen as synonymous terms, and then the maker and the Holy One of Israel echo each other as well. And that allows us to see then that the alternate lines, so two and four, are about the name of God. The Lord Almighty is his name, and then there's a reference to what he is called in the last line. So interlinear here means that uh, sort of between the lines, right, there's, there's something that interrupts the flow, but these, these things are synonymous uh, with each other. So that's simply a variation on synonymous parallelism. Sometimes the repetition is so obvious uh, that there's hardly any difference. And a great example is, is Isaiah 15, uh, verse 1b. Uh, Ar in Moab is ruined, destroyed in a night. Ker in Moab is ruined, destroyed in a night. So really only there's only one subtle change here uh, that we might note, but otherwise this is all the same. Okay, now our second type of parallelism is what Robert Loth called antithetic parallelism. So antithetic. You can think of this as basically a contrast. The book of Proverbs actually has quite a few good examples, and I've, I've provided two here, but I'll just read the first one to you. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Okay. So we can see that there's a contrast between these, these lines. Uh, the first is about being cheerful, and the second is much more about being depressed, let's say, or, or sad. Now, one of the reasons why we see quite a bit of antithetic parallelism in Proverbs is because this contrast kind of makes us reflect, right? It makes us meditate, and as a result, we grow in wisdom. The third type is what we call synthetic parallelism. So synthetic. And this is really about development, a development of ideas. Now, some people have felt that basically what Robert Loth did was anything that didn't fit into the first two cat categories, synonymous and antithetic, he dumped into the last one. So synthetic parallelism often, we don't see much parallelism. It's really about a progression of ideas, new ideas coming into the picture. Should we still call that parallelism? I'm not entirely sure, uh, but this is the, the, the last category that Loth came up with. A good example is Psalm 84. Uh, so Psalm 84, these three verses, there's very little repetition. Towards the end of verse 6, we have a bit of repetition with springs and pools, okay? But otherwise, we have more of a development. Uh, so, for instance, verse 5, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Well, pilgrimage and you, these things are, are not really the same, right? Strength in God, and then people go on pilgrimage. Uh, similarly, we move from the idea of being blessed to hearts. So this is much more of a development of ideas. If you trust in God, then you want to go on a pilgrimage. And that's how the, how the idea develops. Now, it may be that because this, this poem, this song, is about pilgrimage, which is about movement, synthetic parallelism makes more sense. But maybe then we're reading too much into the lines if we start to feel that the type of parallelism is in harmony with what's being said. Although it's an interesting idea uh, and something we'll come back to. Now, there are a couple of types of uh, syn synthetic parallelism that are worth noting at this point. Uh, one of these is what we call staircase parallelism. So staircase parallelism, uh, also referred to as climactic parallelism. So climactic. And the basic idea here is that there's a kind of crescendo a going up the stairs, right? Uh, it's like the um, things get added on top of each other. And so that's, that's really impressive. And it fits perfectly for something like Psalm 93, where the power of the sea is described. And the repetition, the kind of growing of ideas here, 
uh, is somewhat like the waves, which just keep crashing and, and one after the other kind of builds up, right? So the seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Uh, it's a great example of staircase repetition, which Robert Loth argued was a type of synthetic uh, parallelism. And then the last one here, another example of the synthetic type, is what he referred to as numerical parallelism. So numerical. Okay. Basically, this has to do with counting. It's not super common, but you'll see it sometimes. Uh, here's an example. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. So there's a focus on counting here, kind of adding up uh, of examples. Okay, so at this point, I hope that you can see that parallelism provides a great, great sense of clarity when you open up almost any poetic passage in the Bible. Psalm 1 is a great example. Uh, as you can look at this, this image, you can see that all three types of parallelism are present. And suddenly there's order, right? As we read, we go, aha, now I can see what the poet is really doing. Uh, so that's fantastic, but I should also end this video with a few notes of caution. And in particular, I'm going to mention four things to watch out for. So first of all, Robert Loth was not entirely original. Okay, so he was not entirely original in coming up with this. Uh, people had noted the repetition in the Bible before, although often they saw this as just one among many poetic and rhetorical devices, and so they did not draw as much attention to it. The second thing to note is that it's not just found in poetry. So we don't only find parallelism okay, in poetic passages, not just poetry. You can find parallelism in prose as well. Uh, and so some scholars have argued that maybe it's not a key feature of poetry, it's more a way of thinking, the way in which ancient people emphasize things. But you shouldn't push that argument too far either, because it's, it's very clear that there is a difference between the poetic and the prose passages. Uh, in the third place, okay, we should always be aware of exceptions. Exceptions. And when you, when you read Robert Loth, you sometimes feel a little bit that, you, that you're dealing with very basic shapes. So if you're learning shapes for the first time and you were only told that there, you're told that there are only three types of shapes, right? Triangles, circles, and squares, let's say, then you might be like, okay, but when I look at nature, when I look at life around me, uh, life is much more complex. So we really need to start, to start to look at exceptions to these three basic types of parallelism. And in future lessons, we will certainly do that. Okay, and then finally, Robert Loth focused probably a bit too much on similarity. Too much similarity between the lines. Okay, too much similarity between these parallel lines. Uh, and we will definitely see that often it's much more important to focus on the difference between the lines rather than the repetition. But those three categories are a great place to start. Uh, we're going to complicate them, but it's really important to know these basic three types, synonymous, antithetic, and synthetic.